now we're ready to start. Uh, uh, 16 of you signed up. Welcome to all the rest of you. Uh, hope you're not way out too far in, in the back. Uh, a couple of uh, ground rules. Uh, in the year 2005, past, uh, my Pastor Steve Greaser came to me and said the Southern Ohio Synod is doing a, a major discussion around the homosexual issue. Our conference has to do a uh, major event. And then the old rule is flattery will get you everywhere, said you are the guy who's got the reputation in the Synod to be the Bible scholar. Will you do that discussion for us? Now, I find it very hard to believe that I was the only one in the conference to do that. But again, flattery gets you everywhere. So, so this, this program was put together for a Saturday four-hour workshop here at Good Shepherd. And then it has been modified many times over the, the, the coming year. Uh, at that time, we did about uh, six passages. I said there were six passages in the scriptures about homosexuality and sexual behavior. And immediately when the presentation was over, Bill Luke came to me and said, what about the seventh one? And gave me a text. It's not in it this time either, Bill. I, I, I left it out. It, it's not going to be there. Uh, then I got invited to several churches to do this as they were going through the process that Good Shepherd is going through. And they all said, we want it to be an hour. So I cut it down and then Pastor Heidi asked me to come and do this for the church council and she said I had 45 minutes. <laughs> then she said, will you come and will you do it and let's Let's read the text instead of just talking about the text. I'm going to meet that only halfway because some of the texts are extremely long and fill in, but we'll, we'll take a look at the scriptures. Um, uh, and then uh, we decided that we would take up to two hours so that there could be dialogue. If this was going to be done in 45 minutes, you couldn't say anything. But, but uh, we're going to have this dialogue between us. Uh, and the rules around the dialogue is you can ask any question you want, and I will try to answer it. If you want a rebuttal, you can have a rebuttal. I'll answer it, and then it's done. We're not going to spend an hour and a half going around the same barnyard. Uh, we will agree to disagree. It doesn't mean that you're wrong, and I'm right, or I'm right, and you're wrong. It means we disagree. And uh, everybody in the discussion here, I believe, probably has the best interest of the church and really wants to grow in their faith. Uh, but there's always different viewpoints, and I think we have to honor those, those viewpoints. Uh, my instruction, every place that I've been is I have to be neutral. So I am being as neutral as possible, but every place I've said that, afterwards somebody walks up to me and says, I know where you are. <laughs> But I, I will try to be as absolute fair to both sides of the discussion uh, as it is presented. Uh, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Now, one of you, I won't mention Betty Griffith by name, uh, but one of you, after hearing some of my talks, said, uh, you've changed your positions when you were pastor here to what you're saying now. And my answer to that is absolutely. Uh, and I would, I, I pity people who over 20 or 30 years can never change a single position that they've taken. I think change is a part of life. But again, I'm going to go back and say we're going to, we're going to try to do this to be as absolutely neutral as possible. And then you know, it's up to you to make up your mind. And as this is laying out the church council when it votes on whether to have a, a marriage between two, two people of the same gender uh, where they are, uh, that's, that's your decision. Uh, good, we got, we got the rules. Oh, silence the phone. I thought you had a silent phone. Uh, by the way, this is being uh, taped, uh, so uh, don't say anything you don't want to be on YouTube. Uh, uh, 
and I'll try that. Uh, I will also, several of you when you came in asked me, uh, did I spray uh, stuff on my arm so when the nails go in, uh, they won't hurt too much, but we'll, we'll see where we end up. Uh, we're going to look at the scriptures and, uh, and the practice of homosexuality, and we're going to do this basically through four, four biblical texts, and this, uh, this gives us chance to do much more in the way of discussion and ask questions. And these four texts, uh, whether you count six or seven uh, uh, texts in the Bible, uh, are representative of, of what, what is said in every other text. Uh, so we're, we're not leaving anything out. Uh, the Bible really does not talk about homosexuality. The reason is it wasn't an issue in the Jewish people. Uh, and the Bible only talks about what is an issue at the time and the place. So the fact that if there's an absence of text uh, is because we're not debating that. You know, a whole bunch of people will tell you there's a thousand texts about how we spend our money and how we use our money and wealth because that was a major issue. But, but in, in across the board, uh, the, the Bible really doesn't talk about it because nobody was raising the issue about what do we do uh, around homosexuality, around homosexu uh, homosexual marriage, marriage between people of two genders. So, uh, we got four texts out of seven. We got Leviticus 18, we've got 1 Corinthians uh, 6, and we've got Romans in chapter 1. And these are the texts that are quoted over and over again uh, when we get into the, this, this discussion. Now this discussion began in the Lutheran Church, the ELCA, back in 1988. The first bishop of the ELCA wanted to uh, bring the issue of homosexuality and marriage uh, and, and make it uh, <coughs> part of the Lutheran Church in a positive sense. And every bishop since 1988 has had that on their agenda. It finally came to fruition in 2009 when the church voted. So, so this is not, uh, from contemporary history, this is not new. In the history of the church, it's brand new. So it depends upon how, how you look at it. Uh, and we're going to look at these two, two uh, issues, uh, this issue, from two perspectives. We're going to talk about it from a traditional perspective, and we're going to talk about it from a current perspective. I don't know if those are good terms or not. Tradition means this is what was taught when I was in seminary. 48 years ago. Current means new thinking within the church since I graduated from seminary. So we're, we're using the 60s, 70s as a mark of, uh, if you went to any seminary before, uh, before 1970, you're probably going to hear the traditional side. If you begin to look at writings within the church and writings among historians and writings among the biblical theologians, you're probably going to hear more of the current side. Now, at Trinity Lutheran Seminary, which is the seminary of the Southern Ohio Synod, the faculty is divided. So, if I was doing this for the faculty, I could almost see the room divided between those who are the traditionalists and those who are the, the current people. Uh, and uh, the church is still divided uh, among congregations. Uh, congregation just outside of Centerville is taking their second vote to leave the ELCA over this issue. And the issue was in uh, 2009. So we, we still kind of have the, have the fallout from, from that. If you want to use other terms, um, uh, the church in Reading, St. Paul in Reading, uh, came and took this presentation from me, and the pastor said, I would have been crucified if I used traditional and current, so I said interpretation one and interpretation two. Uh, fill, in, fill in whatever whatever you want to do. I, I, I don't care as you, as you do this thing. All right. 
we're going to look at uh, chapter 18 of Genesis, and it's uh, I, we brought Bibles if you want to look. Um, 18 and 19 is very long, so I'm just going to kind of give you a very quick synopsis in reading the text. 18 begins with uh, Abram being at Moray, and uh, Sarah is told that she's going to have a baby for the second time. And then when we get down to 16 and 18, it goes, uh, then the man set out uh, from there, and they looked uh, towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set out my out on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall become a great nation and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? No, for I have chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. And then it goes on that uh, Sodom is going to be destroyed. And so the men, two men were there, so the men turned from there and went on to Sodom, and Abraham remained standing before them. And then it becomes very clear what's going to happen, that Sodom is going to be punished. And then... Um, and then, uh, since it's going to be punished, Abraham gets to be a, uh, to begins to bargain with God. It really takes on its, its charge. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom, Lot's, uh, Abraham's nephew. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, please, my Lord, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet, then you can rise early and then go on your way. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, and they turned aside and said to him, and entered his house, and he made them a feast, and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city and the men of Sodom, and both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Now, in the Bible, to know somebody is to have sexual relationships. So when a man marries a woman or a woman marries a man and they know each other, it means they went to bed together. Uh, they had intercourse. So whenever you hear in the scriptures they knew each other, you, you know they're talking about sex. Uh, within, I mean, the context will dictate that. But that's just an automatic given uh, among the most liberal and the most conservative uh, interpreters of the, of the Bible. Um, let's see, where did I leave off? Uh, and Lot went out to the door to the men, shut the door after them, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let, them, let me bring them out to you. And do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under my shelter roof. In the Old Testament, hospitality was the highest uh, uh, virtue that you had. And so if you had a guest in your house, everything else would be sacrificed for the, for the guest. We, we don't think that way, but this was just paramount rule. Uh, and most people today look at this text and say, it, it's, it, it's terrible. And yet I would argue with you that in World War II, this text was lived out a whole bunch because every time a family hit a Jew, if the Nazis found them, the women would be raped, they would go off to concentration camps uh, because they took seriously, we have a moral obligation to our neighbor. So, so it's different circumstances, but the same kind of thinking goes on uh, among those people. But they replied, stand back, and they said, this fellow came here as an alien and he would play the judge. Now we uh, now we will deal worse with you than with them. And they pressed hard against them, and the story goes on. Uh, Lot does not turn over the two men 
some uh, scholars believe the two men were angels. Uh, but, but, but this is the nature of the story. Now, if we're going to put this in uh, Reader Digest fashion, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed because of its wickedness. Now, that's the key word here. Because of its wickedness. Angels are sent to warn to Lot. Uh, some biblical writers will say two men, and others will say uh, two angels uh, came to warn Lot of the destruction. They had the conversation about uh, Sarah getting pregnant in the beginning of 18. Uh, you'll notice that language also in Luke when uh, you go to the tomb on Easter morning. Uh, there are two men there, and some translations will say there are two angels there. The word here is, is synonymous. It really doesn't matter. The traditional thing is wickedness in this text is and has always been defined as homosexuality. The wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, since the, we start getting commentaries on the text, always define it as homosexuality. And the definition comes from a Jewish theological perspective. In Judaism, uh, the Jews have always been a very small minority people, insignificant. The only reason that we know anything about Israel at all, it was always the border between the world superpowers in, in the time of the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. So it became a very important place because of its location. But if it did anything at all to stop procreation, it could not survive. It would not have the population to survive. So for Jews, in order to survive, there was never to be anything that would stop the process of, of uh, procreation or women having children. In fact, uh, women in the Old Testament were expected to have 20 children in their childbearing years. I don't know a single woman who's ever wanted to have 20 children. But survival is a very strong motivation. And so the Jews, unlike their neighbors, condemn any sexual act that would stop the, uh, the conceiving of a child. The current thinking among many is there's no clear definition of wickedness in the text. It doesn't say homosexuality. That's how it has been interpreted. And if, that, if, if homosexuality was totally against the, the norm, uh, then you would say that. But if it was really against homosexuality, this side of the argument says it should have said homosexuality is evil. Therefore, the lack of the definition allows various interpretations of what the word wickedness means. And we're going to see that uh, very much when we get to the Romans text, which, which deals with the same kind of issue. But, it, but when you go back here, most of the time when this argument begins to happen, we begin to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, and here, here is the issue about this. So then if we go from there, the traditional side is going to say around this text, this story is a story about homosexuality. And you base it on the angels come, the angels say, uh, Sodom cries out, the uh, men come, uh, and they want to they know the men in the house. That's a sexual issue. Uh, the daughters of Lot, for the tradition of the time, uh, are offered. They say no, they want the men. On the current side, the story is about rape. Because obviously the crowd is going to rape the two men.
So when you talk to the current people coming out of seminary or read the current books about it is, here is a story of rape. And what the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is really about, rape uh, in any way, shape, or form is not acceptable among God's people. Be it uh, male raping female or female raping male, uh, homosexual raping homosexual or whatever, rape is, is, is all. And they, 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 drop the, they drop the homosexuality from the issue at all. It's not mentioned. Uh, I've talked with about four pastors who are just out of seminary. The only thing that they have heard is this side of the story. And they are surprised at that side of the story. Yes? Okay. Oops. I got a question. I have a question about they offer the daughters, which is a horrible thing. Horrible. And you say that like the tradition is to for hospitality and protection of yes. What about protection of family members? What was the tradition? Well, the highest order was hospitality. So so let's say uh, to take it uh, to take it out of the out, uh, out of the sexual issue. Steve I, just killed my brother, and we're out in the wilderness, the desert. And he comes because there's no water or anything else, and he comes into my camp. The rules are: I must feed him and comfort him and care for him and give him a place to sleep because he cannot survive in the wilderness without me. I'm not sure as a 21st century guy, if he just killed my brother, I would kill the fatted calf and welcome him into my house and give him a bed to sleep. I think the problem gets to be, we look at this from a 21st century view, not from a, a if Abraham lived in uh, between 2000 and 1800, but but this text was probably written uh, someplace around eight or nine hundred. So we're going back 3,000 years and trying to understand what is their values. And I wonder somebody 2,000 years from now will look at us and say, what about? I don't agree necessarily with what he did, but I know from his moral point of view, he had no option. Does that, does that answer it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask you to agree with it, did I? No. But, that, but that's where it came from. Now, we can, we can synthesize the two and say the story is about homosexuality and the story is a story of rape. And we can put, at the, probably of all the texts, the easiest ones to kind of put together and to make it happen. So uh, when my colleagues uh, take this position, and if I took that position, we can say, can we both agree there's rape in here? Yes. Can we both agree it's homosexuality? They say no. Just, just the way it is. Now, the book of Leviticus uh, is, the, is the law book. Um, if ever I'm asked, have you read the whole Bible, the answer is no. Because Leviticus is the best Samanex tablet you can ever take in your entire life. You cannot stay awake and read a whole chapter of Leviticus at one time. It's, it's just impossible. But, but, but it is a law code and there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is kept and, and why it is it's done. But the Holiness Code uh, is a set of laws designed to keep uh, Israel and their neighbors separated. It, it's a differentiation. Uh, and what you know from organizational structures that every organization needs to have a uniqueness or nobody will join you. We are a unique people. Uh, uh, why, why would I want to go to church? What does the church offer 
that nobody else offers. And if I can get everything that happens in the church uh, someplace else, then why don't I go to someplace else? So, so this very tiny little nation had to figure out what do we do that's different that we can invite other people to come in and say, you will have a different experience in this place then you will get it you see in a, a psychology class or you will get uh, going down to um, uh, the free store and serving food or you will get by taking care of uh, uh, children who are abused and whatever else. Uh, do we offer something different? Now all of those things are very good and we can do all of those things but what what do we do that we say only in the church or only among God's people do you get this? The holiness code was used by the Jewish people to say this is what sets us apart. There are 613 laws within the holiness code. And the litmus test for keeping it was, and this is off the subject, but in the New Testament, uh, table fellowship. Who's invited to the table? And if you keep the Sabbath and who's invited to the table, it indicated you kept all other 611 laws. I'm not sure that's true. It's an assumption. But it's the way it was. Leviticus is often dismissed, but people will argue, that within the book of Leviticus, chapter 17 to 26 is separated or, or is, uh, is of much higher value than the rest of the book. Now, if anything said about homosexuality was in 1 to 16, uh, it would be argued that's the lesser part of the book. It doesn't count. If it was in 26 beyond, it doesn't count. But the fact that uh, there is a text within this very, very, very holy code about homosexuality uh, makes it stand out. So the tradition will let me read the text. In chapter 18, we have, we have you, you cannot show uh, a man's nakedness, you cannot show a woman's nakedness, you cannot uh, be naked in front of your family and else, uh, elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> but, in, but in verse 19, it reads this way. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. You shall not have sexual relationships with your kinsman's wife and defile yourself with her. You shall not give any of your offspring to sacrifice them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not have sexual relationships with any animal and defile yourself with it. Nor shall any woman give herself to an animal to have sexual relationships with it. It is a perversion. <laughs> All of chapter 18 is of, of uh, forbidden sexual relationship with family members. I read the homosexual part out of that instead of reading the whole chapter. And you certainly cannot have homosexual relationships with, with your dog at home or the cow in the yard or the sheep or whatever else. I mean, this, and, and we know that those kinds of sexual relationships were happening in the world at that time. Uh, uh, and most nations around Israel just ignored it or accepted it as a, as a matter of fact. Israel stood out by having these kinds of very strict sexual kind of relationships basically between a man and a woman. Since it happens in the uh, 
holiness code, the laws are to be taken absolutely literally, and there's no way around it. We've got the traditionalists would argue. The current people don't even try to argue against that. Uh, the current people say the most of the book of Leviticus is irrelevant. My favorite foods are outlawed in the law. There's nothing better than shrimp cocktail before dinner. Alaskan king crab is super. Lobster would be just absolutely fine. Uh, all forbidden. Anybody here eat shrimp? Lobster? King crab legs? Uh, you, 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 you know? Uh, the law says I can only walk so many steps per day on the Sabbath. Do any of you, I know you all got your Fitbits, but do you do it so that you keep the law that you can't walk more than these number of steps on the Sabbath? I mean, the whole book is full of, uh, of the 613 laws, we'd probably throw out 600 of them. Therefore, this side of the argument says, since most of Leviticus is irrelevant, its teachings on homosexuality is irrelevant as well. I think on the current side, this is probably the weakest of all the arguments on the terms of the current side. But, but it is the one that is continually offered up on this text. Now, uh, <clears throat> any questions on Leviticus? Okay, now, from, um, from um, 1 Corinthians 9. There, there is, I put this in the wall, oh, 1 Corinthians 6. There is always the question about who, who can belong and who can't belong to an organization. If you don't have any rules about who can belong and who can't belong, uh, basically all you have is a gathering of people who have no common purpose, no common vision, no common strategic plan, no common anything. So, so, so every, every organization basically has to define who can belong and who can participate. One of, the, one of the current debates going on within the Lutheran Church is, do you have to be baptized to receive Holy Communion? The traditionalists over here would say, absolutely. I mean, it has been since the first century. You must be baptized to be a part of the table. <coughs> Many pastors, and this has nothing to do with age, because they're young and old, will say, it's the Lord's table. Whoever happens to be in the sanctuary is welcomed at the Lord's table. And there is this massive debate going on. Uh, uh, and our bishops are being very careful as it's going on, uh, because it has the potential of, uh, did I lose it? Yeah. Careful with this one, because they don't want to divide the church Again, the way it was divided in 2009 over the homosexual issue. So it, it's not front page news, but everybody knows it's going on. At least everybody in the clergy knows that this is, that this is going on. So who, 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 cannot, uh, who cannot be a part of the kingdom? Or who cannot be a part? Uh, and the first one is fornicators. Now some of the texts, in different translations of the Bible will say, those who are sexually immoral. There are those who point out that uh, adultery can only happen if you're married. So if, if I'm married and I have sexual relationships with somebody besides Joyce, the funeral will be two days in the future. Uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the life will end. It, there's no question about that. Uh, uh, but uh, that's adultery. What a number of people will say, well, since I'm not married, I can sleep around all I want. It's not adultery. I'm not breaking the married relationship. Uh, Paul often uses fornication to mean premarital sex. 
So those, uh, and this was very common in the Roman Empire, this is very common in his culture, so he's, he's dealing with a real cultural issue. He said, no, 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 marriage is for the, mar uh, sex is for the married people. And uh, not, uh, idolatry is the worship of false gods. If you're going to worship any other god but Yahweh or any other god but Jesus, Jesus is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You can't be a part of church. I mean, this is what sets us apart. Now, this has nothing to do whether you're a good person or a bad person. I know some non-Christians that I think behave as well as, if not better, than Christians. They just don't believe in Jesus. Yeah, we have adulterers, so we have the fornication and adultery. Then we have Malakoi. I'll tell you what that means later. Then we have Arsano Kai Te. Then we have, come on, thieves. Uh, in Ephesians, there's a wonderful little text, let the thief get an honest job so he can give to the poor. You work so you can share your wealth with those who don't have as much as you do. Uh, it's, it's very seldom quoted uh, any place, but, it, but it's there. The greedy. The, remember the, in Luke, the farmer that had such a bumper crop, he had to tear down his barns to build bigger barns. No, 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 no. The, the, the parable probably means you, you, you have such surplus, you take your surplus and you give it to those who have none. Drunkards. That does not mean you can't have a drink. Often we take the, 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 the teachings on, on drinking as and always drunkards. Uh, my, my favorite scripture passage when I'm doing programs like this is 1 Timothy 5.23. And 1 Timothy 5.23 says, don't drink just water, take a little wine for the stomach. Now I think the author of 1 Timothy 5.23 really has some very keen insights in, 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 into what's going on. Revelers, big what crazy parties and stuff, and robbers. That's the list. Now, what do we do with four and five? Those are Greek words, but I didn't put it in the Greek because my PowerPoint doesn't have the Greek alphabet. Uh, so, the first one is male prostitutes. Male prostitutes cannot get into the kingdom of God. That's the, that is the meaning of the word. And the second is sodomite, which is uh, a sexual relations through the back end. Now, that is what the two Greek words mean. But how do you translate them? If you're a traditionalist, both words are homosexual acts. They, 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 there, there's nothing there. If you're a traditionalist, Paul is referring to Leviticus text. And therefore, we go back to Leviticus uh, chapter 18, which we had been at, and said, this is it. It, it. it is just done. Now, if you're a current person, you note that uh, uh, in... Uh, you would go to something like Webster's Dictionary, and if you uh, look at Webster's Dictionary, uh, most words have the primary meaning is one, or another meaning two, or another meaning three, or another meaning four, or another meaning five. They would argue that some place in the list of various meanings or the way to understand this text, one of those various meanings is 
that malakoi means soft or effeminate. And they go on to say it might mean forcing one to play the female role in a homosexual act. So you are abusing a person uh, if you're if you're ha having sex with them by forcing a male to be the female in the relationship. And the key word there for this group is forcing. An abuse, and scripture has always been opposed to any type of abuse of another person. So this becomes extremely uh, consistent with with the, the term. And if we go down, it means a male uh, making a bed. I don't know why it's not showing the whole thing. But it means forcing one or you become the dominant partner that makes the other person do whatever you want. So what these, what the, what the, uh, and what they, what both of the, but both of these terms mean is that, or have the nuance of being exploitive. I'm just going to take advantage of you because I have the power. If you want a modern way of looking at this, we now will take uh, executives and pastors and doctors and lawyers to court uh, if they uh, force someone uh, who they supervise to have sexual relations with them so that they can keep their job. And the argument gets to be, this person has all the power over this person who just really could not say no. Now, that's, uh, the current is not around the sexual issue, but the principle is exactly the same. And the, the folks who come to the current side will point to that kind of principle is, one person has power, that does not mean you can force, dominate, abuse another person in what's happening. And so they will look at these two words in those lists. They do not try to remove the words or make sure, make believe they don't exist but they will go to uh, an alternative interpretation of what the words mean. Good, good. So, the traditional side. There are no nuances. The text is the text. The text says it, I believe it, that settles it. It's not just the way it is. And the text is just as relevant today as it was for the church in Corinth. Now, if we come to the current side, since the words used by Paul may, and I, and I want to stress this, back in 2005, when I did this, uh, I, uh, I, went to, I, got, you know, I got material from, a, from the committee in the Southern Ohio Synod on Homosexuality, and one of the chief people who provided that material was Barbara Kaiser, who was religion professor at Wittenberg University. Barbara, at that time, was probably the most liberal person that I had ever met in terms of theology. Right? She was off the charts, if we can use left. In 2005, the words that this side used are may. which seemed to be very standard from everything else I read. By about 2007, about 2008, uh, the word may was dropped, and it says Paul uh, used exploitation. There was no may. This is exactly what it means. So we've gone from 2005 to today, from a may to, if you read any of the modern texts from the current side, is this is what the word means and there's no possibility that it just might be homosexual. That, that's just left off of the curriculum. Oops. Uh, and so therefore, the two, the two words four and five really are not talking about homosexuality, but they're talking about abusive relationships. It's how it's understood.
um, in Romans. The first, uh, the first, uh, all Paul's letters begin with an address. They tell you what the letter is about. Uh, when Paul says, I thank you, I, I give thanks to you, he usually tells you what he's going to talk about in the letter. And then, uh, beginning with 18 and going on, uh, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. And then he talks about idolatry. Idolatry is the worship of false gods. And then when we get to verse 26, this is where, it, where the rubber hits the road. For this reason God gave them up to degrading passions because of their idolatry, because of their worship of false gods. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way also the men giving up natural intercourse with women where were consumed by passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. It's tempting to say, especially from a, from a current point of view, the Genesis, X, uh, Genesis story is old, ancient, it doesn't apply. It's rape, and it's tempting to just ignore Leviticus because most of the laws in Leviticus don't count. And then we can argue about how do you interpret the Greek words in First Corinthians. But among Lutherans, and I would say among most Protestants, uh, Paul, and especially Paul in Romans, is the gold standard. So this becomes the text that really gets to be different. When you don't have the gold standard, you can get around it. When you start getting into the gold standard, and the, 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 the two Pauline texts, 1 Corinthians and Romans, is the gold standard. Uh, uh, we got it. So the tradition says, we're going back to, uh, we're going back to uh, Genesis. What's the first commandment in Scripture? What's commandment number one? Be fruitful and multiply. We go back for survival. We need procreation. Above all else. And some scholars argue from that text that we take on the image of God when we are fruitful and we multiply. We make something new. Idolatry is the cause of all deviant, dysfunctional behavior. I think that we, we need to change the word sin to deviant or dysfunctional behaviors because that's what sins are. Nobody in today's world really understands the concepts of sin, so this would be the modern term. It's my terminology. And the teaching is universal for all times. The current folk, the real issue is idolatry, the worship of false gods. And today, the current people would say false gods are money. If I have enough money, I'll be happy. False god is, uh, I, I did a lot of counseling work with a, a woman who absolutely believed and dedicated her life to getting her PhD. Uh, she had an extremely tough life. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of the gory details and fell apart after she walked across the stage, got her hood, got her PhD, because nothing really had changed. But was absolutely convinced, worshipped getting that PhD because it was going to change all of life. Uh, we can talk about prestige, we can talk about uh, so, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So if you worship the wrong thing, if you value the wrong thing above its real worth, you're going to somehow be screwed up in life. 
And Paul in that first chapter of Romans, when he talks about idolatry, could list a whole bunch of behaviors, but he doesn't. But he lives in a society that, uh, that is absolutely opposed or devalues children, so you do not want to have children. Men did not want to have children. So they would use any other sexual means to gratify themselves so that you didn't have children. Meaning any cavity in the body, male or female, outside of the vagina, was a way to gratify yourself. And Paul, uh, Jews would never allow that. I mean, the whole Jewish uh, mental was women were important. Jews thought of women much higher than any other society in the ancient world. Now, by today's standards, they were male chauvinists. But by the standards, when the Bible was written, the Bible was really written by women's livers. And when I take biblical texts and put them against the context in which they were written, Paul is the most liberal, liber, woman's liber, uh, in the history of the ancient world. We read Paul today and we say he's a male chauvinist because we don't understand the culture in which he was written. So we're going to deal with idolatry, not necessarily creation, and we're not going to deal with uh, other issues. And uh, they would argue here that really the lying of men with other men is really grown men lying with boys, which again was a very common procedure, way of behaving in the first century in the Greco Greco Roman world, because we don't want children. Of money, I mean, you had to raise them, you had to spend money. Uh, they were not valued at all. So, yes. So, so they say that might be men laying with little boys, or whatever. Yes. But there was a specific passage about the women. So, how do they? How how does the current? They ignore the women. They, they I've not seen anybody deal with the women. I've only seen them deal with the men. So the next time I'm with that group, I'll ask. <laughs> All right, now. Both traditional and current scholars agree that the Bible does not have a positive teaching, not one, on homosexuality. If you're just going to read the text, literally, you cannot find a single text that says homosexuality is good. Again, I'm going to go back to where we started. It wasn't an issue. So you have so very little written about it. We're taking uh, a, a specific issues that are being addressed. And since it's not an issue, it isn't there. Now, you remember back when I, I, I read that in Leviticus that you cannot sacrifice children uh, uh, to Moloch? Scholars will argue that the first time, or the first time, the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Okay, we got the story. It is either a, an unknown story or it is a story that somehow suddenly arises uh, when the Jews in the 600s decided that maybe if they sacrifice the first child, the wife will have many, many more. So it was very common that when the first child was born, the child was killed and it was put under the, door, the, the doorstep going into the house so that there would be many. The, the Jews were copying all of their neighbors. This was bringing in what the neighbors did. And suddenly there is the story that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, but he stopped because God does not want child sacrifice to happen. 
And what does God do instead of the child sacrifice? He provides a ram in the bush. This is how scripture is written to address very specific kinds of issues that are happening in that day. And the work that we have is what issues, what issues are similar to those that we can apply scripture. Yes? When you say that it wasn't an issue of the time, I mean, there were men sleeping with men and women yeah. sleeping, because we see that in Romans. So how was it... How is it not an issue at the time? Because men and men weren't wanting to get married, and women, oh, because they oh. weren't wanting to have a family lifestyle, yeah. or among in in the borders of Israel, Judah, homosexuality was just not practiced because they needed to survive. They needed to survive. I don't sure they thought it through that way psychologically, I have, but they look around and say, we're small, tiny, we don't have enough to survive. So this became a way to differentiate Jews from their neighbors. It existed in the world, but it did not exist yes. in the Jewish community. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, many on the current side will want to say, uh, uh, Ignore the fact that, it, that this differentiates by downplaying that it happened every place else in the world. They will downplay that this is one way that the Jews or God's people differentiated themselves. From What's the part is whether the Jews made that decision or whether it was you know, God you know, instructing that. That's where it gets tricky. We don't yes, know we, we believe scripture was inspired. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a, a second. But uh, they were the ones who wrote the words. <laughs> because there are no positive texts towards homosexuality, all of the traditionalists will say, if you can show me one text, I'll change my mind. Now, we can explain away some of the texts, but if you can show me one, and it's just not there. Uh, and we just have to just say that. But the people on the current side will say, uh, the negativity and the combination is really about abuse in sexual gratification. That's their argument. Now, if we leave it there, the, the, I think the, the, the heavy weight is on the side of the traditionalists. If we leave the text there, that's where the heavy side is. But, but there are two other considerations. And these two other considerations, uh, I think, are what drives the argument. But you can't have these two until you understand the biblical texts. And the first is, uh, the first is, uh, what does the, uh, the two other factors that enter is the interpretation about homosexuality. Uh, and uh, there are uh, three, uh, there are one to three levels of teachings in the scripture. And when we talk about what homosexuality and how we deal with it, where does the text fall within which level of the scriptures here? And the other is, who's the audience of the Bible? Who's the primary audience of the Bible? So, The Bible can be divided into three levels or three categories. The first level is the core teachings of the Bible. What are the core teachings of the Bible? Deuteronomy, there's only one God, God. And you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and your, all your soul. That's it. Uh, Jesus is Lord, New Testament. Jesus died, rose again. Uh, 
You can be an extremely good person if you do not believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior who lived, died, and rose again. By any definition of Christianity, you're not a Christian. That has nothing to do whether you're a good person or a bad person, moral or immoral. The definition of a Christian is one who believes Jesus is God's son. He lived and he walked the earth. We can argue how many years that is. That scripture gives us a whole bunch of alternatives. He died on the cross and he rose again that we might be forgiven for our sins. That's just fundamental. Uh, the hardest decision Joyce and I had to make uh, when we retired was where we're we going to go to church because you're not allowed to go back to the church you served. Retirement was easy except for that one. So uh, I tend to have a strong personality. I don't know where I get that reputation, but you know, it's mine. And Cincinnati only has small churches, and I was very afraid if I went to a Lutheran church in Cincinnati, suddenly all I'd do is move my eyes, and then somebody would say to the pastor, but Pete says, and we'd have a fight. So, so Lutheran churches were off the agenda, just because you've got to keep peace in the church. That's one of my values. So we go, we attend a Methodist church. My membership is still here. And I make sure I take communion at least once a year, and I make sure you get my offering so I meet all the constitutional requirements. I am a member here. But I said to the pastor where we go, my, my great joy is teaching. And then he just got real quiet. He said, and what are you going to teach? And I thought, uh-oh, here we are, here we are. So I'm going to teach the Trinity. And you could just see his eyes roll and say, well, you can teach that here. I'm going to teach Jesus is God's son, lived, died, resurrected. And he said, you can teach that here. I'm going to teach the Bible is the written word of God. Not always to be taken literally, but the Bible is written for our instruction. You can teach that here. I'm going to teach the priesthood of all believers because I don't believe the church treats its lay people according to the priesthood of all believers. I think you all have a ministry and you all need to be working at that ministry. You can teach that here. Now that's four out of four, right? I'm the final round in the Olympics. I'm going for gold. So I decided to push his button. Not that I ever done that before in my entire life, but I do push his button. And I said I believe in the real presence in communion because that's uniquely Lutheran. Jesus is present in, through, and under. The Methodists believe communion is a memorial meal. Jesus is in the church, but Jesus is nothing but the elements. And he said, you can teach that here. And at that point, we called the doctor. We got the mask up. Watchers may mask on. We could. Uh, those are my core teachings. They're unchangeable. They, I mean, nothing. I can. I can't imagine. I, I suppose I will never say never say never again. But but but, those are the core teachings. The Bible has maybe six or seven or eight of these. And only six, seven, or eight. The next level is moral teachings. And moral teachings change over time. In the scriptures. For example, You shall not steal. Remember that's a commandment? That, that, that's number seven by Lutherans. It's number eight by the Methodists and the uh, Episcopalians. We number the commandments differently. When you shall not steal was first recorded, first written, it was the kidnapping commandment. The commandment should be thou shalt not kidnap your neighbor's oldest son because that's the inheritance. And then it's expanded to be, 
uh, neighbor's property, maybe his family, neighbor's whatever is your neighbor's. But we have a whole list of expansions of you shall not steal. When the commandment thou shall not commit adultery was first written, it only dealt with men hitting on upon their neighbor's wife. It was very specific. And then we expanded it, or the scriptures expanded to be, you are faithful to your spouse or spouses. Remember, Abraham had several wives. Uh, Jesus is continually arguing the morals with other Jewish people who were scholars uh, around moral issues of what do you do with divorce. In Matthew, you can only divorce if your spouse committed adultery. In Luke, there is no provision for divorce. But in Paul, if you're not getting along, especially for religious reasons, of course you get divorced. Which, which, which is the rule that we should follow in our church? And you can quote texts. They're moral texts. And I could probably give you another hundred examples, but I, you know that, that gets to be the point. Think about the moral changes in the last 50 years. When I was about eight or nine, I remember standing in front of my church. My mother was having a conversation with a woman who said, I can't go in there, I'm divorced. That was standard thinking in the 50s. Does anybody believe that now? Then, yes? Even though the moral like, might be expanded or, or modified, there's still the basic foundation. <clears throat> you don't steal. Divorce is not good. But, but there's, yeah. there's circumstances yes. that, you know, I kind of like, you, you love and support someone through a divorce, but you don't necessarily celebrate because it's sad. Oh, or, you, you don't know. celebrate. But Paul says, do it. Because if you keep somebody who is an unbeliever, you're beating on them, you're abusing them, so end the relationship where there's peace. Now that's radically different than Luke. Never. But you always, if you go back and you read the text, there's always this kind of debate. And people settle on this one or this one and refuse to recognize each other. Is taking physical life the same as hating? But suddenly, you've heard it said of men of old, shall not kill, but I tell you, if you hate your brother, you've killed him. And there's always this moral, and this moral debate has gone on for 2,000 years in the church. Think of the civil rights movement. Are blacks equal with whites? I remember the argument you, in World War II, you cannot give a white soldier black blood because it's different. Does anybody believe that today? This never changes. This can take up to 50 years to change. Long debate, painful debate. But it's for 2,000 years, that 3,000 years, 4,000 years since, since the Jewish people has been going on. The problem is, we don't think much about the issues that were solved in the 1800s and the 1700s and the 1600s. We get caught up on the issue of right now. Piety. Personal piety changes daily. Piety is, uh, I, was a, I was raised in the Finnish Evangelical Lutheran Church of Brooklyn, New York. Try to get that on letterhead. <laughs> when the pastor said to the congregation, when the pastor said to the congregation, let us pray, every pious thin sat down because we pray sitting down. When we joined the LCA and the pastor said, let us pray, every pious person in the church stands up. 
When you pray, do you sit down or stand up or does it make a difference? That's personal piety. My, my father was a Roman Catholic. I always thought my mother was a Presbyterian, but then somehow it came out she might have been an Episcopalian. They're both Christians. It doesn't matter. When my parents were going to get married, my mother's side said, you cannot marry a Roman Catholic. My father's side said, you cannot marry a Protestant. I think one of the things that made their marriage work so well was they're going to show both sides of the family they were absolutely wrong. The rule in our house was we don't talk religion because we're not going to start a fight. We're not going to talk religion because we're not going to cause a fight. So we never said grace. We, you know, none of this stuff, except when it's, uh, it was a small church in Brooklyn, New York, so every family invited the pastor out for Sunday dinner where they would get roast beef or whatever else because we didn't pay them anything so they could buy their own food. But you know, and except the time when the pastor came to our house, we would have grace, but the pastor had to pray because he was the only holy person in the room. <laughs> After I was ordained and went home, the only time they ever said grace was when I was there and the pastor had to pray. Notice I'm no longer son. I was taught you do not pray in a restaurant. Am I no longer a Christian because when we go out for dinner we don't pray or say grace in a restaurant? That's personal piety. We treat not saying grace as if it's a core teaching. Often the piety issues are much more important to us than the core teachings. What, I came into the church with the black hymnal, then we went to the red hymnal, then we went to the green hymnal, now we're back to the red hymnal. That's four different sets of personal piety. So, the argument gets to be this. Which category is the Bible's teachings on homosexuality? If you believe that homosexuality is a core teaching, unchangeable, now remember we have a whole bunch of other things in there, then the only way, the only thing you can do is to say homosexuality is absolutely condemned. If you're going to put it in that top category, that's where you have to come out. To be true to that category. But if you say it is a moral teaching, like all other moral teachings, then you can discuss with the possibility of changing. Now, I read the, tele, the table fellowship as personal piety, so I don't bother throwing all of that stuff in there. So, where do you put this teaching? Is it a core value that can never, never be changed, along with there's only one God, Jesus is Lord, resurrect, Jesus lived, died. Is that the category it goes in? Or is it, this is how we, this is a moral teaching, and we recognize that moral teachings are changing by expansion or even by dropping them, some of them. And that will, that will determine how you read all of those, those four texts that we've read. Now another way of looking at this is who's the audience? <clears throat> I'm going to give you two definitions here. A good book is a book where you agree with the author or the author gives you something that you like to think about. So when somebody says to me, this is a good book, I agree with the author or the author is going to give me something that I like to think about. A great book is when the author agrees with you. I just finished, it was just released about a month ago, I just finished The Death of White Christian America. I think it's in July. 
I ordered it ahead of time from Amazon, and they said, well, you have to wait X number of weeks before it's, it's out. So uh, I, I, just, I just finished this. And, and what it does is it talks about uh, the political power of white Protestant Christians. Uh, back in the 20s and 30s, 74% of uh, people voting were white Protestants. So we were the voting bloc. Everything ran around us. Uh, today, that's not so. We're on, we're on our we're a small part of the voting population and what all of that means. But what he does is, and I, I've hinted at this and said this for years around here, but now I've got proof because he gives all kinds of numbers to make it happen. So if you want to play the numbers game, we can play the numbers game. What he says is there's generally two approaches to the scripture. The two approaches are, is the Bible written to inform and bring about moral behavior in individuals? Is, is the Bible a book about person? Is it personal? Me. So, if I take this book and go to uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, and I say, I read the Beatitudes, and uh, the Beatitudes are, the first one is blessed, is blessed is the person who is poor in spirit, is the first Beatitude. Is that a, a, a teaching about poor in spirit means knows their need for God. If you're going to read about what poor in spirit means, it means I know my need for God. Am, am I a person who knows my need in God? Or is the Bible written to inform and bring about social change in society? It's written on the corporate level. So, blessed is the church, or blessed is the community, or blessed is the country who knows its need for God. been trained to read the Bible this way, as its individual. Except for the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, and then one letter that we are sure that Paul wrote, Philippians, every other book in the Bible was written for a community, not for an individual. And the primary question for every other book in the Bible, except for those four, is what does this text say about my church? Or what does this text say about my community? And then we can draw conclusions about what does it say to the individual from that. But the first question you always ask of a text is what does it say to the community? So, the audience. Those who interpret the Bible as being written for individuals tend to lean or totally embrace the traditionalist point of view. And that view, and now these are sweeping generalizations. I know they're sweeping, but it's a place to hang your hat. This view here, is written, is, is adopted through the Bible Belt and in the South. Death of white Christian America does a lot with the civil rights movement. The Southern Baptist Convention refused ever to approve a single community law against civil rights. Their stance was, this is written for individuals, individuals to decide how they want to deal with blacks in this country. We will not get involved or we will work actively to stop any law that uh, removes discrimination against blacks. That's in writing, that's not opinion. And they cite document after document, president after president, 
preaching that. So if we talk about all of the homosexuality texts, here, this group, predominantly conservative, white, ecumenical, white evangelical Christians, would say, this is it. And they would take the traditional viewpoints of the four texts that I did. Those who interpret the Bible as written for corporate values, how do we remove discrimination? How do we uh, make sure that uh, women get equal pay for equal work? How do we push women's rights? How do we push civil rights? How do we do this? will read the Bible much more, lean towards or totally embrace the, the uh, current understanding of the texts. Every mainline Protestant church, now not all of its members, and not all of its clergy, but the vast majority, the uh, Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, United Methodists, and the UCC church, are the leaders in interpreting scripture and in leading civil rights movements in this country to this point. And we had the political power, and this is basically Northeast or the upper parts of the Midwest. If you think the Bible was just for individuals, chances are, and there are notable exceptions, you're going to be a traditionalist in the interpretation. If you believe the Bible really preaches, speaks to organizations and uh, society, chances are you're going to be a person who comes at it from a current perspective. Now again, there are notable exceptions to those rules, but it's a way to understand that I grew up in a church that continually taught this at least in its social actions, because we were very strong. Now, the ironic part of that is I did a, uh, I did a, and we did it here, we did it here. Um, the five major teaching sections of the book of Matthew, because Matthew is wrapped around five major teaching sections. And I announced at the beginning of that course, we're going to look at these texts from the point of view of what does it say to a church. That's where it was written. And it was not until the third teaching section that I said, I talked about all of these texts only from the individual point of view. So I have to go back and rewrite the first three sections of that. Because that's the temptation, always to look at it from the individual point of view, even when you're trying to do it from a corporate.